Hi, my name is Daniel Biggs. I'm the new production manager at Blue Mountain Television. And just a couple days ago uh, at our uh, broadcast center, a gentleman by the name of Scott Tigerson came in. And Scott brought in some photos of his son and daughter-in-law. Um, I could tell Scott was very um, excited about these photos and, and about a story he wanted to share with us. So we sat down and, and Scott uh, began telling us about the story of his son Hans Tigerson and his stepdaughter Mindy Tigerson um, and their mission efforts in Rwanda. And it was a very compelling, um, fascinating story. And so <coughs> Here today, we've invited uh, Scott, uh, excuse me, um, Mindy and Hans Tigerson into the studio. They've uh, recently come back from Rwanda, and they are going to tell us a little bit about what they're doing in Rwanda. Well, welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So, well, um, guys, can you please just start by telling us a little bit about yourselves and, and uh, who you are? and what's happening right now. Yes, Daniel, thanks for uh, having us here. Um, my name is Hans Tigerson, um, and this is my wife, Mindy. Um, we're from Westland, Oregon, um, and I'm a commercial uh, builder developer, and uh, we're uh, alumni. I'm alumni of Walla Walla University, and uh, you know we've had a desire to get involved in missions for some time. I'm Mindy, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, but I'm also working full-time with our um, project, Impact Hope. So I'm busy. <laughs> One thing is enough, but uh, a mom is, yeah, we all know it's busy. It's good. Well, I could, uh, I could just sense uh, your father, Scott, is just passionate about what you guys have been doing. I can tell he's just a proud father. Um, I can tell he's caught the vision of what you guys are doing. Um, in this, and part of the story is about the genocide. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the story of the genocide? Um, yes, Daniel. Um, we've all heard a lot about the genocide and it's a very, it's a story that's very close to us. Um, and especially to this day. The genocide happened back in 1994. It was a tribal um, issue between the Hutu and the Tutsis. Um, in Africa, there's uh, definitely some very distinct tribes that their heritage goes back a long ways. The Tutsis were kind of the dominant tribe. Even though they were a minority, they had been more wealthy. Um, better educated, and there was a lot of propaganda going around about um, these Tutsis. Unfortunately, um, being they were more educated, they also happened to be a lot of them were Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, there was in roughly 100 days, there was between 800,000 and a million people massacred um, in 94, April of 94 is when it started. And uh, it continued for some time until a liberation force of Tutsis came in from the Congo and a very small force was able to push out um, the perpetrators. After that, these, the Hutus fled um, and roughly two million Hutus fled because of fear of repri reprisals, Rwanda, and settled in the Congo, where they've continued their acts of genocide to this day in an area that was predominantly and is predominantly Adventist. Oh. So what's happening now, can you tell me a little bit about these refugees, where they're living, and you know the living conditions, you know, um, what, what, what kind of state, what, can you describe a life that they're having right now? Well, after the perpetrators came into the Congo and began genocide, um, many of these Adventist people who were being targeted fled into Rwanda 
there. They were in an in a initial encampment called Mudende, which is actually at the Adventist University. Unfortunately, it was close to the border of the Congo, and and people from the Inter Ahamwe, which was the Hutu militant organization, came over in one night and slaughtered around 1,200 people. After that, the Rwandan government placed the, the people who survived into another camp called Gehembe, and that camp still exists today. The Gehembe camp is one of five Congolese refugee camps in Rwanda. There are now over 100,000 refugees, most of whom are Seventh-day Adventist. They are provided by the UN and the government of Rwanda, uh, 24 cents a day for living expenses. They are given one tarp a year for their roof, and they're provided education through ADRA Rwanda up through the ninth grade. These camps are also, they're a, basically an open air prison, you would say. They're in a very remote area, typically in unusable land, um, on a hillside. Basically, it's land that's disposable in remote locations that uh, um, isn't being used. And they're living in very harsh living condition, mud huts, steep ground, n no electricity, no heat, no uh, running water. Um, and so it's a very, um, you know, just difficult living situation. Um, mm -hmm. so. It has to be a, um, touching and um, heart-wrenching to meet these people who have been displaced and their family members have been killed and now they're struggling um, to, to begin again. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you got involved and what, what brought you over there? Well, um, we had been praying and we had a real desire to get involved in missions. Um, we had uh, several, um, roughly a year before we had sold a business, we had committed to trying to get involved in a third world mission type organization. Um, we had even applied to uh, try to go as missionaries and nothing quite worked out. Um, at a uh, Easter um, breakfast, uh, roughly um, two years ago, we met a gentleman that was telling us about these refugee camps and how they all happened to be Seventh-day Adventist and how these were the smartest kids in Rwanda that they were sponsoring through scholarships to go to university. And his desire was because we were Seventh-day Adventists that we would try to help raise money for these scholars. Um, we had never heard about the approximate 100,000 Seventh-day Adventist refugees in Rwanda uh, until that event. And our first response was, how could this be true? And so um, a year ago this time, I, I flew over with this organization and a number of their key sponsors and visited these refugee camps directly. And um, we felt like God uh, was really calling it on our putting it on our hearts to get involved in telling the story that we were so touched by um, these brothers and sisters um, and their conditions that they've been enduring. One thing that we also found out in this last year, the kids who were in the ninth, up to the ninth grade decided to put together what they called a hope school. And they gathered anyone who had any former education before becoming refugees and said, will you please teach us high school classes? In that HOPE school that was formed, some of the most brilliant students in all of Rwanda, based on their college entrance exams, were, um, were selected by this organization that, that told us about the refugees. And unfortunately, last year, the Rwandan government closed down the HOPE school because it was not accredited. So we feel we need to do something about these kids who are in the gap between ninth grade and twelfth grade. So this is 
I feel where we are right now, our mission is to help in this way, is to educate these kids. Guys, we gotta take a break. Um, and on our break, we're gonna play a video that you guys have, um, have put together. Uh, I've just seen it the other day, so we're gonna share that with our viewing audience and um, we'll be coming right back um, after the video and continue our uh, conversation here with Hans and Mindy Tigerson. Thanks for watching. Ask if any yeah. of the students are seventh day Adventists? Yeah, no problem. Can I ask? Yeah. Are you sure you are the Adventist woman? Yes. Can you raise your hand? Almost. 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 We can tell you that our students need, need really the help to attend the university because they didn't have that chance. Thank you so much. Who will help us? You know that's what 
Hi, thanks for watching. Um, today we're interviewing uh, Mindy and Hans Tigeson and about their trip to Rwanda and their mission efforts there. Um, and as we we're talking on the break, it's just fascinating to know that this genocide happened in 1994 and there's refugee camps there to this day. To this day, it's, it's a... Um, it's a very touching story, um, but let's begin our, our return to our conversation. Um, Mindy, can you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing, what you're organizing, and, and what your efforts are in this mission right now? Yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, we have, since February, we're been working with ADRA Rwanda. We've um, formed a partnership where they are running our program and we have 234 young Col Congolese refugees in four different Adventist boarding academies in Rwanda. We're very proud to be working with ADRA. I think as a Seventh-day Adventist, we're, we always hear about ADRA in the news, and they're one of the first responders with re relief. And so it, being a part of their organization is really impactful for us. We're um, very excited about our students. They're in school for the very, for this first time out of the camps. They're sleeping on a mattress for the very first time in their life. They're eating three meals a day for their first time. And they're, they say they're happy, happy because they have no other words to express. Just the gratitude that they're feeling to be in school and to have this opportunity. And when they say it, they, they just they take you by the the hand and make sure you're looking at them because they want you to know how grateful they are to be in school and just the the first the things that we experience on a day-to-day -day basis there that we take for granted they're experiencing for the first time in their lives and for me it's very exciting they're they're very grateful and they're promising to work very hard so that they can become educated and work for their families so that they can um, escape poverty and have a better future. These kids, um, this is their, their ticket out, their hope um, in this life. And it's so amazing to go there and see these kids and how vested they were spiritually, Dan. I had never experienced um, adults, let alone kids, that God is truly their strength and how they're surviving in this environment and um, their whole life is wrapped around their spiritual home in heaven and they truly are refugees um, on this earth which we you know it, it we all need to realize that our homes in heaven but this is giving them an opportunity and their families if they can get educated where they can get a job they can have a hope of life outside of those camps here on this earth. And, um, <clears throat> you know, as we were talking a little bit, um, there seems to be a real desire for them to learn about more about Seventh-day Adventists. They, they, you know, they get excited to talk about the faith and to talk to somebody that's a Seventh-day Adventist and they want to know more and they want to be fed, it seems like. A you know, that... Uh, um, it was so amazing going there because my first visit to these camps, I was with an organization that had been sponsoring them to go to university and meeting the family, meeting the scholars. Um, as soon as they found out I was a Seventh-day Adventist, their attention quickly turned from this organization, their sponsorships, and they started asking me questions about the Seventh-day Adventist church, about the church in America, and their life is totally um, wrapped up around their faith and God being their strength. But the bond between Seventh-day Adventists was so incredibly strong 
and the, the testimony that they made to these other people. Um, I was very, very proud to be an Adventist mm -hmm. and very, very proud of these people. They're, they're amazing people that, you know, the closest, I, I think of about Paul and Silas in prison singing, celebrating um, when they were in prison, and that's what these people are doing. They've been doing it for 18 years, um, celebrating their faith and, you know, their fact that they're Seventh-day Adventist. So, guys, what can we do now? What's what needs to? Um, how how can people help? Um, and, and why is it needed? Well, for our program, for six hundred dollars, we can send one child to school at an Adventist boarding academy for an entire year, and that includes a new mattress which they've never had, sheets and blankets, hygiene kits, doctor visits, medical insurance, basically all the essentials that they need that are provided for $600 for a, one school year. The uniform, the everything. books, mm -hmm. everything. This, the is food. A, this is an incredible bargain because tuition at these schools is more than $600, but due to our relationship with ADRA, and the desire of the Rwandan Adventist Conference to get behind these refugees because they've also realized that these these people have nothing in their plight. So uh, this is an incredible value that it, um, there's no way without the, these organizations' involvement we could offer this. Mm -hmm. And how much, guys, of the donations that you receive, how much are you given? A hundred percent of all dollars received goes directly to this program. That's wonderful. Um, guys, can you tell me maybe just a couple success stories, something, you know, some, some miracles or, you know, what's maybe some students that you've seen that have gone through the school, you know, how has that impacted their life? Well, every s person in these refugee camps has an incredible story. They've experienced incredible um, just difficult situations of, you know, death and just living in very adverse conditions. So every, every person has an incredible story. What we've been able to, to do is bring some hope, not just to these kids, but to the whole refugee camp. Because having just 20,000 people in roughly five different refugees. Each camp has about 20,000 people in it. And for a few kids to get out brings hope to the whole camp. Mm -hmm. And it's so amazing because they're, the whole camp is celebrating, you know, 30, 40 kids being able to go to Adventist um, boarding academy. So we're not just bringing hope to these kids, which they are taking this opportunity and making the best of it. So, so they're seeing some Seventh-day Adventist people come in and helping as much as they can, and it's just um, giving hope to everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Guys, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, if you'd like at this point to talk to our audience and just let them know, you know, um, Whatever you'd like, whatever you'd like, you just whatever you'd like to say to the audience. You know, if there's an appeal you'd like to make, please go ahead and do that now. Well, we just we have been drawn to these people, not only because they're dear people, but they're also our brothers and sisters as fellow Seventh Day Adventists, and we feel a connection, and we have the desire, and we have this God-given desire to help, and we sincerely offer that to everyone to help these people in in their dire situation for only six hundred dollars or even less if you can't afford six hundred dollars but a, one student can be taken out of these camps and our ADRA person she says even to take one person out is enough but you've taken 234 and we just we want to do more and more there's many more children in these camps who are desperate for an opportunity for a higher education. And we just pray that others will be touched by this story like we have been and will be willing to help with, the, with this program. 
Thank you. Dan, um, for $600 breaks down to roughly $50 a, a month. $50 a month is a little over a, almost $2 a day. We can make an incredible difference in these people's life and 100% of those funds raised goes directly to ADRA to fund these refugees. Um, these people, their faith is strong. These are people that will help finish the gospel and it's an incredible story. These were called to be the hands and feet of Christ and I think this is one of our opportunities to not just help people in need but also to take care of fellow brothers and sisters of the faith and to help further the gospel because these people are 100 percent. I've never experienced such devout Christian people and I would love for every person watching to have the opportunity to experience what we've experienced. It's been inspiring and um, life-changing for us and that's why we're here because we feel as fellow brothers and sisters we need to get involved and we want to make that invitation open to everybody. You know I just I know there's I know there's a lot of um, fundraising projects a lot of missions that need to be done but this is a very dramatic one this is this is um, these people really, really need your help. They're living destitute conditions, and this is, and it's not just helping one person. It's helping a lot of people, mm -hmm. giving them hope. And so I, I praise God for what you guys are doing. And just, um, guys, we've got to wrap it up now. Can you tell us how? Can you tell us about a phone number and a email, or a, excuse me, email, phone number, and uh, and a website we could go to? Sure, our website is uh, www.impact-hope.org. And our phone number, if you'd like to give us a call, is 503-673-3905. And our address is Impact Hope at 2500 Willamette Falls Drive, Suite 207, Westland, Oregon, 97068. Okay. Well, guys, thank you so much for what you're doing. Praise God, and, and um, may God be with you and, and that you continue your work. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for watching Valley Viewpoint with me today. My name is Daniel Biggs, and we appreciate you uh, listening today, and God bless.